If you want confirmation of the correctness of the Benko Gambit, take a look at the players who play it. World champion Kasparov uses the opening frequently. So do Gelfand, Adams, Fedorowicz and Hodgson. They can't all be wrong. In fact, such is the strength of Black's position in the Benko Gambit accepted that most top players today decline the Gambit. They don't regard acceptance of the Gambit pawn as a particularly practical proposition if they want to win. The Gambit is introduced by the following moves. White plays 1d4, Black knight f6, White plays 2c4, and Black goes 2c5. White pushes on, 3d5, and now Black plays 3b7 to b5. White takes on b5, 4c takes b5, and now Black plays a6, gambiting a pawn. And when white takes on a6, that's 5b takes a6, we get the typical position for the Benko gambit accepted. Black can take on a6 immediately, but it's more accurate to play g6 first. And this is the current choice of virtually all the grandmasters who play the gambit. That's 5g6. White generally responds 6 knight c3, and only then does black take on a6, having avoided some dangerous white options. Now I'm going to divide the theory into three major sections. In the first section, White will fianchetto his king bishop. In the second section, White will play for an early e4. And in the third section, White will try to prepare the move e4 by playing either knight f3 to d2 or f4 followed by knight f3. Due to the strength of the Benko Gambit accepted, most top players prefer to find some way to decline the Gambit. In the past few years, several dangerous systems have been developed and Black must be on the ball if he wants to emerge with a good game. After 1d4, knight f6, 2, c4, c5, 3, d5, b5, I'll first consider the variations where White plays 4, knight f3. We then move on with 4, c takes b5, a6, to consider the trendy variation with 5, f3. After that, we'll be looking at the moves 5, e3, followed by the Zaitsev variation, that's 5, knight c3. And finally, another topical move, 5, b6. At the end of all this, I'll consider a few odds and ends to complete the options at White's disposal. Against White's solid opening move, d4, the Grundfeld defence with knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, and now the move d5, is one of Black's most aggressive options. From the outset, Black aims for lively and dynamic peace play and it's no surprise that this opening has been a favourite of no fewer than five world champions. Alexander Alekin, Mikhail Botvinnik, Vasily Smyslov, Bobby Fischer and of course Garry Kasparov. Many players are put off from playing the Grundfeld by the thought that there's too much theory involved. But in my view they're mistaken. The Grundfeld can be played with a minimum of theoretical knowledge and here's how to do it. The variations we're going to look at first involve White's most principled plan, which is to take the pawn on d5, with c takes d5, and after knight takes d5, play e4. This is known as the exchange variation. What black should do now is capture the knight on c3, and after b takes c3, he plays c5, followed by bishop g7 and then hammers away on this d4 pawn, probably with moves like knight c6 as well. This line most clearly illustrates Black's Grunfeld theme of counter-attacking on the long diagonal using his bishop on g7. The other line in which White sets out to create a broad pawn centre is known as the Russian system, and is distinguished by the moves knight f3, and after bishop g7, white plays queen b3, attacking this pawn on d5 once again. 
black should then play d takes c4, and after white's queen takes c4, he intends to expand in the centre with a move e4. Of course, black doesn't stand idly by while white does this, and I'm going to show you a plan developed by Mr. Grunfeld defence himself, Vasily Smyslov. He castled kingside. After e4, developed his bishop out to the g4 square, attacking this knight, and then set about putting pressure on the d4 pawn by bringing his king's knight back to d7, and then around to b6, simultaneously attacking white's queen and hitting the d4 pawn. One d4. It's a good move. It can't be faulted. So what are we going to do? Perhaps d5. c4, c6, the Slav defence. Bolster it. Block it all up. Perhaps we can get a draw. No, you're damn right we're not going to do that. We want to play the Benoni for thrills and spills. d4, knight f6, c4, c5. Imbalancing the position. For some reason, when I hear the name Benoni, I always conjure up images of that Star Wars character, Obi-Wan Kenobi. His weapon against the forces of evil was a lightsaber. Let your weapon be the Benoni as you combat the Darth Vaders of the chessboard. Throughout the tape we'll be looking at White's main move, and certainly his best move, pawn up to d5. Just for a second though I'd like to talk about any wimpy alternatives that White may have. One possibility is e3. This looks a bit funny because the bishop on c1 is locked inside of the pawn chain. A sensible continuation for black would be g6, knight to f3, bishop to g7, knight c3 and castles. What black can do in the near future is trade pawns on d4, c takes d4, e takes d4, and then play pawn straight up to d5. The likelihood is that white's going to end up with an isolated pawn here on d4, which is going to be attacked by the knight coming to c6, and of course extra pressure from the bishop here on g7. White really won't want to consider capturing on c5, d4 takes c5, because, well, black can always regain this pawn with pawn to e6 and bishop takes c5. Or, alternatively, knight a6 takes c5. Therefore, the only other move worthy of consideration is white knight coming out to f3 immediately. One idea I quite like for black then is just to take this pawn on d4, c takes d4, and after knight takes d4, play a quick pawn up to e5. This would appear to weaken the d5 square, but after knight b5 hoping to come into d6, there's a very aggressive variation that black can play. Pawn up to d5, white pawn captures on d5, now not recapturing this pawn on d5 immediately, by virtue of a check which will appear on c7, but rather bishop to c5, pawn up to e3, and castles. Instead of aiming to regain this pawn here on d5, black can seek to attack. He can force the knight back at some point, and then advance the e-pawn in order to give the e5 square to the black knight, or perhaps to the queen. In conjunction with the bishop, if white castles kingside, he could be in all sorts of trouble here. The pawn on h2 would be an obvious target. I did feel it was important for me to mention this, because a lot of players that do play the Benoni, in fact, opt to make a Nimzo Indian move order. Confused? Well, let me explain. The problem is, after d5, e6, knight c3, e takes d5, c takes d5, and pawn to d6, which brings us into our typical Benoni position, white has the option to throw both of these pawns 
down the centre of the board. Hello, International Master Andrew Martin here and welcome to this Foxy Openings DVD on the Grunfeld. We'll be splitting the material up into two separate DVDs. On this first DVD, we'll be looking at the very important exchange variation and also the fianchetto variation. Meanwhile, on DVD 2, we'll be covering all the other remaining white systems. Two things you ought to know at the outset about the Grunfeld. One, it's a dynamic opening and fluid counterplay is the order of the day. In the Grunfeld, <coughs> black often allows white to dominate the centre early on, but then he's going to hit back at that centre and try to destroy it. Keep active in the Grunfeld. This is very important. Passive play in the Grunfeld rarely pays dividends for black. So with those observations in mind, it's time now to turn our attention to the first system under discussion. And this is the very important exchange variation where white plays C takes D5. I estimate you are going to get this in at least 50% of your games with the Grunfeld. And there are good reasons for this. With C takes D5, White allows himself to get a big centre with e4. Black's more or less got to take on c3, bishop g7. And now White has many different ways to deploy his pieces. It's this variety and this ability to take the centre so easily that attracts a lot of White players. But Black should be satisfied too. The bishop on g7 is unobstructed. And there are definite chances to break down the White centre with a well-timed c5. We're going to be looking at <coughs> most of the important exchange variation systems which white can play and I'll be suggesting solutions for black um, against each. Some of these solutions might not be regarded as best by the theory books but I'm interested in what works in practical play. Now the first system I want to consider is bishop c4. A move I think first played and popularised by Alexander Alekhine and a very logical move too, because the bishop's on probably its most aggressive square, eyeing f7, and white basically intends to put his knight on e2. The advantage of knight e2, as opposed to knight f3, is fairly clear. The knight can't be pinned with bishop g4, and the f-pawn is free to go. It's this aggressive option of pushing the f-pawn that once again attracts a lot of white players to this variation. Now in the books you're going to see that most most of them recommend c5 in this position. But I'd like to suggest uh, an old variation of Larson's, which I believe could give White a few problems and certainly should set him thinking. It's a line which is being played more and more these days at the end of 2009 and which is achieving good results for Black. And that is the rather unusual Queen d7. That's a peculiar idea. What on earth could be the point in Black playing his Queen up to d7 in this position? Well, Black certainly has to now think about how he's going to deploy his queenside pieces. <clears throat> the usual way <coughs> is to bring the knight out to c6, to push the pawn up to b6, bishop comes to b7, the knight on c6 goes to a5, and eventually a well-timed c5 will come, attacking white's centre. Now, I just want to compare this, just going back one move, with perhaps a line where Black plays b6 straight away. This may introduce the same scheme, but Black's reasoning in playing b6 is that he doesn't want to declare the position of his queen so early in the game. Well, against b6, it turns out that the move h4 is strong, which brings us right back to our game. And what now would happen if white played h4? Well, Larson's intention in this position was to bring his queen out to g4. This halts White's attack, and um, in fact, due to the pressure on e4 and g2, more or less forces the exchange of queens after knight g3, which of course is not what White wants. I mean, actually, I imagine in this position, after king takes d1 and now c5, black is better already.
The first white system we're going to consider on this DVD is the Russian system. Uh, a dangerous line where white plays 5 queen b3. It's my perception that actually at club level you won't have to encounter this move very often but of course it's important to know how to play against it. And White's idea is simply to take the centre and cramp black. This variation crops up a lot at Grandmaster level and there are a lot of controversial variations and very interesting variations um, which occur after this queen move. Now I think theoreticians are agreed about the correctness of taking on c4. This is the right move by which black drags the white queen onto a vulnerable square. Later on black will gain time against the queen hopefully and uh, get a good position as a result. Black should certainly castle and now the first move we're going to consider which is the main line of course is where white takes the center with e4. And so it's obvious black has to construct an active plan of counterplay against this idea because you know if white's just allowed to complete his development in peace let's say just allowed to move his bishops out and then castle bring his rooks to the center he's going to have an obvious advantage so whatever black does here has to be geared towards destabilizing white somehow before he can attain this uh, position of complete development now there are many moves for black here um, black can play bishop g4 this is the Smyslov system. He can play knight c6. That's a move which is very popular at the moment. Kasparov, uh, going back just like knight a6, that's the Prinz system, named after the veteran Dutch grandmaster. But I'm going to recommend the Hungarian system, which I believe is ideal for the needs of the average player, and that is a6. Hi, I'm John Fanning, CEO of Multimedia Engineering Corp. I'm here today to introduce international grandmaster Roman Jinji Hashvili in a series of instructional chess videos. Before shifting his emphasis from playing to training, Roman was considered one of the top 10 chess players in the world. The chess training system that Multimedia has developed with Roman includes instructional chess videos and interactive chess software. How well does this system work? Well, I just finished a six game rated match with the USCF rated master. I won every game. We hope that you'll experience similar results. Thanks. Hi, my name is Roman Jean Jihashvili. I am international grandmaster. It's Jean Jihashvili. I know it's difficult, but I'm not here to teach you how to pronounce my name. I'll teach you something much easier, how to play one very interesting opening, which we, I call myself, let's call it Roman opening. You can call it, you can put your own tag on it, so according to what your name is. So this opening is for black, d4, g6. And of course we know that white can continue here with move e4 or much more common is c4. c4 is more common than e4 because uh, whoever plays you d4, he wants to play the closed opening. Closed. So that's why they continue with d4 followed by c4. Anticipating King's Indian or something like that. So after c4, bishop g7, Again, most common move is knight c3. This is the move you should be expecting maybe 90% of the time. Other moves here are e4 or knight f3. And again, on e4, uh, black has a variety of continuations. They can go with d6 followed by knight c6. But we cannot cover now all these continuations. We probably will cover it in parts two, three, or four. But what we want to do here, we want to go with the main move, knight c3. And now black plays c5, which automatically gives us uh, almost new opening. 
no matter what white does here, black has, I think, very interesting game. Very interesting and position I personally like very much. I played it a number of times. And I had very good result, maybe 80% I scored against very good players. So let's see what white's options are here. White can play d5, the most common move. D takes c, move that I do not recommend for white. Knight f3, which gives black very comfortable position. And e3, that does not create any problems for black. Well, before we get to the main move, d5, this is the main continuation for white. Uh, let's cover briefly other continuations, such as... Hello, this is Roman Jinjihashvili, and uh, welcome back to uh, our series about new opening revelations with uh, detailed and uh, impeccable analysis using latest version of Ripka. Our today's topic now is one of the biggest openings for uh, in modern chess theory, a Grunfeld defense. And we're gonna uh, cover Grunfeld for black, and we're gonna recommend Grunfeld for black. And I wanna tell you uh, based on latest analysis and the games of the top players, we came to conclusion that it's as good an opening for black against d4 as any. And we strongly recommend to uh, play Grunfeld. However, there is one downside. Why? And that's the downside... Uh, that I had in mind when I never made any DVD uh, on how to play Grunfeld for black. I've played lots of games, mostly with white, uh, against Grunfeld. The downside is that when you play Grunfeld, unlike any other opening, white has all the choices of variations. So we're gonna go d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, and white has now a whole bunch of variations. They can play cd followed by e4, which is main variation, and they can go knight f3, g3 and even if they go cd after knight takes d5 <coughs> there is a whole bunch of different continuations for white and black has to be prepared so in other words black has to learn a lot so we on our end try uh, to be try to give you material black as abbreviated as it is possible using novelties mentioning novelties and also not to talk too much about different choices black may have because we always suggest the best uh, uh, choice so however we have to be prepared for any and every continuation white might choose and it's a lot of times we are gonna tell you show you the novelties that we use or use ideas of some other top players so you're gonna have very interesting and very lively material that you will enjoy hello Roman Jinji Hashvili here and uh, welcome to the part two of uh, modern way to play Grunfeld defense. In a part one, which is totally unrelated 
to part two because we looked at the different variations. And I, in a part one, I explained that the only downside of playing Grunfeld defense with black today is because white has all the choices of countless variations in the original position after black's d5. So white has choices what to play. We already covered some main lines, such as cd, knight takes d5, and d4. But main lines is, uh, uh, we call it main because we call, we have to call some lines main. That doesn't mean that this is the best line for white. This is like a more, most controversial line, but there are other lines, other tries for white to achieve some advantage. Those lines have been played by the, some of the very top players in the world, and we have to be very serious, very uh, careful to make sure we get sufficient counterplay. So now we're going to see some um, other lines, the rest of the lines. I don't want to call them miscellaneous lines because some people may consider this one of the main lines. So it's just a matter of opinion, but no matter what we think, we have to be prepared to play against this variation. And we have to approach them the most competitive way because in the Grunfeld, if you are not very competitive in the opening, you're liable to get very, you're likely to get very passive and maybe very bad and dangerous positions. So let's look at the rest of the variations of the uh, uh, Grunfeld defense. And here is uh, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Hello, my name is Roman Jinjihashvili, and uh, today we're going to discuss novelties, some novelties that uh, occurred in uh, some big tournaments latest international tournaments but it's not too many i will show you valid novelties interesting novelties and not such a great novelties that's been played by top players in the world actually played by kramnik and i will explain the nature why it was played actually it will be very interesting uh, uh to know the story behind the novelties um, and then how uh, we refute them. Also, I would like to introduce you to a series of novelties that we adapted in our opening repertoire, namely the uh, uh, Grand Prix attack and there are some significant improvements for white in some, not that white had bad position before, but something that will help us to get most out of it. So this is gonna be very interesting um, DVD. I have to point to you that there is no opening is played today in any tournament that is considered the correct, the same, to play it the same way it was played several years ago. Every opening in chess theory is being improved, is being updated, and it's being filled with different, different con continuations and possibilities, and so is our openings. So sit back and get ready to very interesting addition to your opening repertoire. So let's start 
with our Grand Prix uh, opening in Sicilia. Well, I have few significant improvements in the Fianchetta line, which is the probably most common, and in non-Fianchetta lines when Black plays E6. A lot of people felt very uncomfortable playing against non-Fianchetta lines because I have to admit, if Black does not play uh, Fianchetta, White's plan is not that clear as in the Fianchetta line. That does not mean it's better for Black, no. But once White is very comfortable and knows a lot more in non-Fianchetta lines, you should be just as comfortable as in Fianchetta lines and you should be very optimistic in getting some um, good positions. So let's go on with Fianchetta lines first in any order. So G6, Knight F3, Bishop G7, we go Bishop B5, and this is the Fianchetta line first, uh, where black plays knight d4 normally, and w when we play castle, we do play castling here, black goes a6, bishop c4, possibly b5, bishop d5, rook b8. This is all on our previous DVDs. So we're gonna go d3, e6, and bishop b3. Now here's your host, International Grandmaster Ron Henley. In the years of playing as a professional Grandmaster, when I played d4, one of the first questions I would ask myself in preparing for a tournament is, what am I going to play against the Benko Gambit? What makes this Gambit so dangerous is that Black sacrifices a pawn not so much to play for opening traps or tactical tricks, but rather with the idea of long-term strategical balance, pawn structure, initiative, and active pieces. So today we are very, very fortunate to have with us one of the world's leading exponents of this Gambit and one of the world's finest practitioners, International Grandmaster Lev Albert. Lev, welcome to R&D Videos. My pleasure. Uh, so today we will look not so much just at the theory of the gambit, but we will look also at the history of the gambit. We will look over at the overall development of the gambit, and uh, you will also show us how to develop an opening repertoire. So let, let's start and um, take a look on Benka Gambit and discuss a little bit of history. So it started with uh, the correct Louis move d4, knight of six, c4, which is main line for white. Okay, black plays c5. Yes, bl black plays c5. And white's best move considered to be d5. I remember that, uh, to tell you a brief story, uh, drawing on my experience in Russia, that there was one match uh, between Russia and Moscow and Soviet Olympiad. And it was famous because the team of Russia won this match eight and a half to one, uh, to half. And one of those who lost was Smyslov. Smyslov lost with white. And in this, in this game, he played d5, and then he lost. And after the game, half joking, well, let's say 90% joking, he said, well, I got too ambitious. I should rather have played knight f3. Of course, knight f3 is a safe move, but if white wants to play for advantage, he has to play d5. And here, b5 moves comes, which is called Benka Gambit. Or in Russia, it was known somewhere from late 50s, and it was called Volga Gambit. Volga is big Russian river, it's like Mississippi and America. And a group of masters who lived in cities next to Volga practiced this move. And white, white usually takes. It's not the only move for white, and, uh, but there's certain deviation. White can deviate, white can play, for instance, a4. Well, black better plays before with approximately equal game. Mm -hmm. White can also play like knight, knight of three, knight of three a good move. Mm -hmm. Boris Gulko played against me 
Why can play? Uh, yes, here black perhaps can play either g6 uh -huh. or another interesting alternative is, is before and then and then g6. Also, as, mm, on knight of three, if, uh, kind of the worst come to worst, black of course can take. Sometimes black can play e6, switching to another gambit, so-called Blumenfeld gambit. Uh, so usually, while white certainly has different options, uh, the move which certainly someone should consider before he starts playing uh, Ben Cavalga Gambit is to take on b5. And now a little bit history. Sacrifice the pawn. So what white, uh, black rather sacrifice the pawn. What black gets for this pawn? Black gets some developing. Uh, white pawn on d5 is relatively weak. He deflects c pawn from protecting d5 pawn. And uh, originally, those players who play this gambit, they play it in a classical gambit way. They would develop pieces in the way they would uh, play g6, bishop g7, um, d6, then castle. White in meanwhile would do something like knight c3, e4, knight f3, bishop b2. And here black would start choosing plans. Usually plans would be connected with play in the center. Black maybe, would maybe e6. either play e6 against the center. Or sometimes black would play e5. And after, say, white castles, black would continue in King's Indian style, like knight h5, knight h5 and then f5. And basic idea would be black almost never would play a6. Because black would think in terms why to give white a pass pawn. Because you see, white has an extra pawn, but it's very difficult for white to create a passed pawn. Even I play a 4 5 where is my passed pawn? So it was the thinking of players who play the system with black. In Play the Benko Gambit, Volume 1, with GM Lev Albert, three-time U.S. champion, we, discuss, we discussed concepts and practice. We discussed various strategical and positional ideas, ways of black could get counterplay and compensation for the pawn. Now, in Volume 2, Lev will help us design a complete opening repertoire, providing all the key variations that you need to know to play the Benko Gambit. Welcome to the show, Lev. Uh, where should we start? Okay, Ron, that's my pleasure. And let's start with maybe quickly reviewing whatever is left from those main lines uh, which we analyzed last time. So after moves d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, b5, this is Benka Gambit. And now in the end of our session, we'll look at various ways how white declined to take, how white declined to take the pawn on b5. Uh, and how white uh, take, takes the pawn but then gives it back. But now let's take a look on the main line where black takes, uh, white takes on b5. And black uh, obviously goes a6, which is where modern Benko Gambit is. Benko Gambit first appeared, every player with white was like, well, it can be a pawn up and have a passed pawn on the queen side. Why not? It's exa exactly true, unless they, uh, until they begin to realize that uh, this extra pawn well, black has good compensation for the extra pawn in better pawn structures. You one huge continent against smaller continent and islands. Play over A file and B file with rooks, supported by bishop on the long diagonal. And finally, it was realized that the end game, the end game, surprisingly for the gambit, is good and often better for black, because all black's play lies on the queen side and black is often better in the end game. At that time, white begin to look for ways to play, to keep the queen on the board, and often to try to play for attack. It's for instance, Yasser Serevan, with whom I play several games, with black developer system, where he was trying to attack relatively early on the king's side. And black usually plays g6, is some kind of small subtlety which we discussed last time. So instead of taking on a6, we first play g6, white plays knight c3, and now of course we have to take on a6 because otherwise white would play e4 in one move. Here we look at last time, we look first of all on the move e4, we also look at position by white and chatter. So let's continue with move e4 and look at various ways to attack, namely, first of all, to the Cerevan's method to attack. Well, one advantage here is, of course, you've kept white from castling. True. True, exactly. And black here does certainly that's one white to play five, he plays d6. And now in this position, white has several ways of playing, of artificially castling. Two of them we discussed last time. 
this move to play G3, King, G2. Well, that, that was two games that we had on take exactly. one. Exactly, was Karpov and, and, uh, and Albert. And, and uh, this game won by White uh, by Anatoly Karpov. But we also tried to show how black would improve and at least not to, not to get uh, because, uh, uh, not to get in troubles, and at least not in serious troubles. But I can also try to make artificial castling by longer route, knight f3, king g1, h3, king h2. It, by doing so, he doesn't weaken this long diagonal.